Hello students, this is our 8th lecture in the series Advanced Materials for Energy and Information Technology. In this lecture, we shall discuss about the critical materials crucial for development and evolution of different apparatuses and machines related to information world. Since beginning until now, there are 1.3 trillion materials that humankind have tested to find the best suited one which could prove as a turning point to develop the world of information. This lecture is in four parts and divided into two lectures. So here is the first part. The contents we shall cover under the topic crucial materials are vacuum tubes, transistors, silicon chips, microprocessors, storage, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, display technology. In this lecture, we shall cover the vacuum tubes. The earliest vacuum tubes evolved from incandescent light bulbs containing a filament sealed in an evacuated glass envelope. When hot, the filament releases electrons into the vacuum, a process called thermionic emission. Turning the switch to on closes the circuit. Electrons flow from the battery's negative terminal through the bulb's filament to the battery's positive terminal. The filament has greater resistance than the rest of the electron path. As a result, it becomes hot. Since there is no air in the bulb, it does not burn up but instead glows giving off light. Turning the switch to off opens the circuit and electrons cannot flow. These were invented during 1880. A second electrode, the anode or plate, will attract those electrons if it is at a more positive voltage. The result is a net flow of electrons from the filament to the plate. However, electrons cannot flow in the reverse direction because the plate is not heated and does not emit electrons. The filament or the cathode has a dual function. It emits electron when heated and together with the plate it creates an electric field due to the potential difference between them. Such a tube with only two electrodes is termed as diode and is used for rectification. A rectifier is an electrical device that converts alternating current AC which periodically reverses direction to direct current DC which flows in only one direction. Vacuum tube diode is a device that controls electric current between electrodes in an evacuated container. Vacuum tubes mostly rely on thermionic emission of electrons from a hot filament or a cathode heated by the filament. This type is called a thermionic tube or thermionic wall. A phototube, however, achieves electron emission through the photoelectric effect. Here is shown a collection of different kinds of vacuum tubes. The Fleming valve, also called Fleming oscillation valve, was a vacuum tube or thermionic valve invented in 1904 by John Ambrose Fleming as detector for receivers used in electromagnetic wireless telegraphy. It was also the first diode, an electronic component which conducts current in one direction only and would later be widely used as a rectifier, a device which converts alternating current into direct current. The first prototype flaming valves built during October 1904 is shown here. In oscillation valve, the heated filament or cathode is capable of thermionic emission of electrons that would flow to the plate or anode when it was at a higher voltage. Electrons, however, 
could not pass in the reverse direction because the plate was not heated and thus not capable of thermionic emission of electrons. Early commercial Fleming valves used in radio receivers during 1919 is shown here. The diode tube was a reliable alternative for detecting radio signals. Since the current can only pass in one direction, such a diode or rectifier will convert alternating current to pulsating DC. This can therefore be used in a DC power supply and is also used as a demodulator of amplitude modulated radio signals and similar functions. A device with two active elements is a diode usually used for rectification. Devices with three elements are triodes used for amplification and switching. Additional electrodes create tetrodes, pentodes and so forth which have multiple additional functions made possible by the additional controllable electrodes. By placing an additional electrode between the filament cathode and the plate anode, the ability of the resulting device was observed to amplify signals of all frequencies as the voltage applied to the so-called control grid or simply the grid was lowered from the cathode's voltage to somewhat more negative voltages. The amount of current from the filament to the plate would be reduced. The negative electrostatic field created by the grid in the vicinity of the cathode would inhibit thermionic emission and reduce the current to the plate. Thus a few volts difference at the grid would make a large change in the plate current and could lead to a much larger voltage change at the plate. The result was voltage and power amplification. An extremely thin molecular layer of thorium atoms forms on the outside of the wire's carbonized layer and, when heated, serve as an effective source of electrons. The thorium slowly evaporates from the wire surface while new thorium atoms diffuse to the surface to replace them. Such thoriated tungsten cathodes usually deliver lifetimes in tens of thousands of hours. The end-of-life scenario for a thoriated tungsten filament is when the carbonized layer has mostly been converted back into another form of tungsten carbide and the emission begins to drop off rapidly. A complete loss of thorium has never been found to be a factor in the end-of-life in a tube with this type of emitter. Except for diodes, additional electrodes are positioned between the cathode and the plate anode. These electrodes are referred to as grids as they are not solid electrodes but sparse elements through which electrons can pass on their way to the plate. The vacuum tube is then known as a triode, tetrode, pentrode, etc. depending on the number of grids. A triode has three electrodes, the anode, cathode and one grid and so on. The first grid known as control grid and sometimes other grids which transform the diode into a voltage control device. The voltage applied to the control grid affects the current between the cathode and the plate. When held negative with respect to the cathode, the control grid creates an electric field which repels electrons emitted by the cathode, thus reducing or even stopping the current between the cathode and the anode. As long as the control grid is negative relative to the cathode, essentially no current flows into it, yet a chance of several volts on the control grid is sufficient to make a large difference in the plate current, possibly changing the output by hundreds of volts depending on the circuit. Tubes with grids can be used for many purposes such as amplification, rectification, switching, oscillation and display.
unique in every radio installation is the vacuum tube. Produced in a wide variety of sizes and types, the vacuum tube is the fundamental element in modern radio communication. Radio utilizing these remarkable tubes makes possible effective communication between the air and ground forces. This symbol represents the triode tube with its elements. The plate, filament, and control grid. The cathode may be equipped with an indirect heater. Between cathode and plate is the grid, which is the characteristic element of the triode tube. It serves as a control of the electron flow between cathode and plate. Remove the glass bulb from a triode tube, and the plate becomes visible. Inside the plate, the grid and filament are located, supported by wires embedded in the glass base. This type of tube is equipped with a directly heated cathode. The control grid is seen wound around outside the cathode. In the diode tube, many electrons leaving the cathode move about between cathode and plate, constituting space charge. The triode tube differs from the diode in containing an element known as the control grid, located between cathode and plate. With the grid positive, many electrons pass from cathode to plate. If the grid is given a negative charge, it repels the negative electrons, and fewer of them reach the plate. The grid bias may be so strongly negative as to entirely stop the flow of current through the tube. This negative grid bias, beyond which there is no current flow from cathode to plate, is known as the cutoff bias. The grid thus serves to control electron flow from a heated cathode to the positively charged plate. This circuit represents a hookup to test the effect of grid bias on plate current. With the grid negative well below the cutoff point and the plate positively charged by the B battery, no current is seen to flow around the plate circuit and through the milliammeter. We may chart the flow of plate current with changes in grid bias. The C battery is impressing a minus 20 volts upon the grid. Both the milliammeter and the chart represent no plate current flowing. A grid bias of minus 20 is the cutoff bias of this tube. Now if we change the grid bias to a minus of 10 volts, the milliammeter indicates one unit of current flow in the plate circuit. The arrow on the plate current graph moves up a corresponding distance. If the grid bias is made still more positive, plate current increases. We move the arrow further up on the plate current curve. A still more positive grid results in still greater plate current. Another increase in positive grid voltage leads to the saturation of the tube. A narrow range of grid voltage is thus seen to control the entire output of the tube, extending from zero plate current to the tube's maximum output. This is why the grid is called the control grid. The controlling action of a radio tube results in the tube often being referred to as a valve. This hookup shows grid voltage change in relation to plate voltage change. With a bias of minus 5 volts on the grid and the plate impressed by 100 volts, the milliammeter shows a plate current of 2 units 
as electrons flow from cathode to plate. The grid contains many electrons, constituting a negative charge, which limits the movement of electrons from cathode to plate. The grid thus controls current flow. If we change the grid bias from minus 5 to minus 3 volts, the milliameter shows a plate current rise to 3.5 units. A change of but 2 volts in the grid bias has resulted in increasing plate current to nearest maximum. In other words, a small change in grid voltage leads to a large change in plate current. Plate voltage change affects plate current. With minus 5 volts on the grid and 100 volts on the plate, the milliameter shows two units of current as before. Now a plate increase of 35 volts is necessary to increase plate current to three and one half units. Now if we change grid bias by only four volts, a very great change is seen in plate current. We conclude that the greatest influence on the tube output is change in grid voltage. Most military sets use some form of the triode tube. By hooking a transformer to a triode tube circuit, energy may be transferred to another circuit. The tube is connected to a B battery a C battery, and an alternator. The alternator varies the voltage to the grid. The plate current passing through the primary of the transformer induces a corresponding current in the secondary at the transformer. When the circuit is made to function, electrons pass from cathode to plate when the grid is plus, the flow of current stopping when the grid is strongly minus. The alternator impresses a voltage wave upon the grid. The wave of current in the secondary of the transformer has the same frequency and wave shape as the grid voltage wave. It is of greater magnitude, however. In other words, it is an enlarged replica of the input voltage wave. Thus, the triode tube is an amplifier in that it magnifies a wave without changing its shape. Modern receiving sets of great efficiency owe their effectiveness to the ability of the vacuum tube to amplify waves of voltage and current. Some of these tubes are very small, outstanding examples of scientific engineering. The simple triode tube is actually a complicated electric condenser having three capacitances to be considered. They are cathode to grid, plate to grid, and plate to cathode. The capacitance of most importance exists between grid and plate. This capacitance may produce undesired coupling between the input and output circuits. To shield the control grid, another grid known as the screen grid may be added to the triode tube. A condenser connects the screen grid to the cathode circuit. This bypass condenser enables the screen grid to electrically isolate the plate and control grid. The simple triode tube contains but the three elements, plate, grid, and cathode. The principal electron flow in the tube is from cathode to plate. Electrons reaching the plate at high velocity strike other electrons, knocking them off the plate. This is known as secondary emission. The introduction of the screen grid adds another positive element in the tube, which may attract electrons. 
Pads of electrons of secondary emission cut across the screen grid. These electrons coming from the plate cause an undesirable plate-to-screen current. A third grid may be placed between plate and screen grid. This grid is known as the suppressor grid. Electrons flow freely through all three grids, but the paths of secondary emission are shortened by the negative suppressor grid. As a result, the emitted electrons due to electronic bombardment do not extend as far as the screen grid. The pentode tube represents the highest development of the triode principle. Tetrode and pentode tubes are made in many sizes and capacities. Multiple contacts leading to the tube elements characterize these tubes in their many forms. Although their internal construction may vary widely. The older and somewhat bulky military receivers using earlier types of tubes have been superseded by a set much smaller in size. The greater compactness and efficiency of these sets is largely due to their use of the modern pentode tubes. The suppressor grid between the screen grid and the plate in the pentode may be omitted. Instead, what is known as beam forming plates are substituted. This is the symbol for the beam power output tube. This tube is built with the usual cathode, grid, screen, and plate. The beam forming plates are so placed as to direct the cathode to plate stream of electrons in a beam. Here the stream of electrons carry the secondary electrons, which are knocked off, back to the plate, thereby eliminating the necessity for a suppressor grid. Whether built into great power tubes or into the tiny peanut tube, the principles of the triode tube are basic. Electronics is a science that applies these tubes to the service of man, to the speeding of production, to the winning of the war. To understand how electronic tubes work, let's take a good look at one of them, one that's representative of its species. This is a diode, a typical two-element electronic tube. Let's get inside it. In fundamental operation, it resembles an ordinary single-pole switch. A switch that can connect, for instance, this battery and its motor load. One power lead comes to the anode, the other lead goes to the cathode. When this switch is open, the contacts are insulated from each other by a vacuum, or by some inert gas inserted into an evacuated tube under low pressure. To close this switch electronically, all we need do is heat the cathode and give the anode a positive potential. Then here's what happens. As electrons are emitted from the surface of the heated cathode, being negatively charged, they fly at tremendous speed to the anode. In this way, a current carrying path is formed, which closes our electronic switch and permits our motor to operate. You'll notice, by the way, that the direction of electron flow is contrary to the orthodox concept of current flow from plus to minus. Now, at this point, you may ask, 
If an electronic tube is basically just a form of switch, why is electronics hailed today as the technique of a new engineering era? To answer that question, let's review six of the basic things that we can do with this new kind of switch. In the first place, we can rectify current with it, converting AC to DC. We can do this merely by connecting an electronic tube in series with an AC circuit. As you study this circuit diagram, note that only each positive half wave of AC voltage will now produce a current. When the anode is negative, the electrons are repelled and no current flows. In other words, because only the cathode can emit electrons, we have here what amounts to a one-way street. We can visualize the result of the tube's rectifying action with the aid of these two oscilloscopes. The one on the left shows alternating current coming in. The one on the right shows pulsating direct current going out. The applications of this basic rectifying principle are many and important. Here's one of them, changing AC to DC on the nation's electrified transportation systems. Here's another, rectification for electroplating operations of all kinds, operations possible only with direct current. Still another example, furnishing DC in steel mills for the driving of variable speed motors, such as the one controlling this giant ladle, or the ones driving steel conveyors with such precise control of speeds that danger of buckling and tearing and consequent mill damage is eliminated. Electronic rectification is also helping to build American air power by making available record-breaking quantities of aluminum for plane construction. From Arkansas mud to American air power involves a complicated conversion of material. Before pure aluminum can be extracted from this bauxite ore, direct current must be applied in a vital reduction process. To obtain that direct current from AC transmission lines, the Ignitron rectifier is used. This Westinghouse electronic development changes vast quantities of AC to DC with higher efficiency than any similar type of conversion equipment. Today, it's the main source of current supply for the nation's great aluminum industry, an industry that has achieved a miraculous expansion to meet the demands of a world at war. Magnesium from seawater is another achievement of industry under the stress of war. Ignitrons used in the extraction process speed up the delivering of incendiary and demolition bombs to the centers of Axis production. Still another example of electronic rectification at work is the precipitron, a device for cleaning air electrostatically. This diagram explains how the precipitron works. The rectifying property of electronic tubes is used to apply a potential of 13,000 volts DC to tungsten wires and 6,500 volts DC to collector plates. As incoming air passes through the field of these wires, each particle of dirt receives a positive electrostatic charge. When the positively charged particle reaches the collector chamber, it's attracted to and deposited on negative plates. In this way, air is cleaned so thoroughly that dirt particles down to a quarter millionth of an inch are removed. This is a vital advantage today, not only in homes and public buildings, but in industrial plants of all kinds. For instance, in plants manufacturing delicate instruments where air cleanliness is necessary for precision work in workrooms where optical systems are assembled for a host of military purposes, in inspection rooms where minute parts must be closely examined under high magnification. Air cleanliness is vital too in film developing rooms like this one. To understand how electronic air cleaning helps here, let's go aloft in a reconnaissance plane. Click. 5,000 feet above the earth, a camera shutter opens and closes. Scores of square miles of enemy territory have been squeezed down into an image on a photographic plate. An image measured in inches instead of miles. On this photograph, a city might be covered by a tip of a finger. A speck of dust could hide a Nazi airdrome. The rectifying tubes of the precipitron help make sure that dust, 
doesn't sabotage military photography. Now, so far in this film, we've discussed only one of the basic things we can do with the electronic tube. We can use it to rectify. The second basic thing we can do with it is amplify. Here's how. Between the cathode and the anode of the two-element tube, which we diagrammed a while ago, we now place a grid. To this grid, we connect an input of some weak voltage which we wish to amplify, perhaps that of a faint radio signal from halfway around the world. Now let's see what happens. Every time a negative potential is impressed on the grid, even though it be very minute, it has a large effect in reducing the number of the negatively charged electrons which would otherwise keep flying from cathode to anode. Conversely, when the grid is positive, an equally large effect is exerted in increasing the flow of electrons from cathode to anode. The important thing to note here is this. A small amount of power applied at the grid is amplified into a large amount of power in the anode or work circuit. This amplifying property of the three element electronic tube is put to work in innumerable ways. Westinghouse electronic amplification now helps provide radio and radio telephone contact between airplanes and control stations on the ground, between ships and their communication bases both afloat and ashore between individual tanks and their tank force commanders, between firing line and headquarters, between sea drone lights and night flying pilots who can turn them on by radio signal. In the field of power engineering, electronic amplification permits the measurement and analysis of minute voltages, stepping them up to the point where they can be seen and interpreted on oscilloscopes. When this giant rotor is completed, its precise dynetric balancing will be made possible by amplifying tubes. Testing of these propellers for vibration fatigue will also be facilitated by electronic amplifying tubes. Up to now, we've considered two of the basic things that the electronic tube can do. It can rectify, it can amplify. A third thing it can do is generate. The term generate in this connection is meant in a general rather than a technical sense. A triode is connected for oscillation in the way shown here. The system then becomes capable of changing direct current into alternating current. Note that what we're doing in this case is amplifying in the usual way and then feeding back to the grid part of the amplified voltage. Continued repetition of this feedback results cumulatively in a strong alternating current. This electronic means of generating alternating current is important because it can produce very high frequencies, frequencies up to millions of cycles far beyond the range of ordinary rotating equipment. A familiar application of this is the radio transmitter. This modern transmitting room of Westinghouse Station KDKA is a far cry from the pioneering equipment of its famous predecessor. This scene reproduces an historic occasion, the first time a radio transmitter was used for large-scale public entertainment. This is station KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. We are about to begin the reading of the presidential election returns between Warren G. Harding and James M. Cox. Stand by, please. Here is a new, less familiar application of electronic high-frequency generation. High-frequency heating of 200,000 cycles per second is now used to flow tin as the final step in the electrolytic plating of steel strips. After steel strip comes from its electrolytic tin plating bath, it first passes through a washer, then between hot air drying jets. At this point, the steel strip has a coating of tin that is relatively dull and porous. Next comes a vital step. The strip is raised to the top of the heater unit housing, inside of which is a series of high frequency coils. As the strip comes down through these coils, induced electric current causes heat, which flows the tin almost instantaneously greatly improving its structure as a protective covering. Here's the result. Tin plate that is mirror smooth, free from porosity, so perfect a protective covering that one pound of tin can now do the work of three. Note the horizontal bars in this close-up. These are parts of one of the high frequency coils that affect the tin flow. If you look closely, you can see the difference in texture between the porous tin entering the top of the coil and the shiny flowed tin leaving at its base. 
And these are the tubes that generate the high frequency current which makes the entire process possible. Another important result of this new Westinghouse electronic process is time saving. Tin can now be flowed at a rate of more than a thousand feet a minute. Here's another example of where electronic high frequency generation is doing a job today. Dielectric bonding of plastic and plywood sections in a matter of minutes instead of days. As a result of this application, plywood constructed PT boats can be produced more speedily. Dielectric heating also cures intricate plastic forms faster and better. Here, a dielectrically cured plastic piece is being given a stress analysis. Carrier current relaying also applies the electronic principle of high frequency generation. Here's part of the equipment that does the work. This equipment makes possible an enormous increase in the speed with which transmission lines can be cleared of faults. Its effect is to increase the load carrying ability of a system up to 50% or more. We've now illustrated three of the basic ways that the electronic tube can be put to work. It rectifies, it amplifies, it generates. And here's a fourth thing it does. It controls. This diagram illustrates one of the principal mechanisms of electronic control. We use the grid here not to amplify a weak signal, but to control the flow of power to a machine. To do this, we connect the control circuit in such a way that it becomes a function of temperature, speed, time, or any other variable. As a result, grid potential is varied, and the work circuit is automatically closed, modified, or opened. And we can do all this with split-second timing and incomparable precision. Take, for instance, this electronically controlled spot welder. Without sound, without friction, without flame, electronic control on this equipment makes and breaks contact with split-second timing. Seam welding, too, is electronically controlled. As a result, plane parts today are being literally sewn together with electric current as thread. But welding, of course, represents only one opportunity for electronic control. Automatic stepless regulation of motor speeds is another application. Without the smooth acceleration which such control makes possible, delicate materials, such as the capacitor windings being handled here, might be broken under the shock of starting and abrupt speed changes. Now for still another basic thing that the electronic tube can do. It can also serve as a bridge to transform light into electric current. Here's how. We replace the ordinary heat-activated cathode of a two-element electronic tube with one made of photosensitive material. Light can now replace heat as the stimulator of electronic emission. The stronger the light, the greater the electronic emission, and consequently, with the aid of an amplifier, the more power flowing through the work circuit. This is important because it means that photoelectric tubes can function as light relays and so be given an almost infinite variety of jobs to do. Scanning the soundtrack of the talking motion picture film you're listening to right now is one of them. Another is the television camera. The iconoscope used in this camera is merely a special form of electronic tube. Product and process control is still another application. In this plant, a photo troller automatically stops a conveyor belt every time a lightning arrestor comes to its point of inspection. Here, a Westinghouse electronic eye inside the metal housing spots pinholes in metal strip as it comes from the rolls, automatically operating a relay that rejects defective sections, dropping them out of the production line without a moment's loss of working time. One of the most important basic things that the electronic tube can do remains yet to be listed. Besides transforming light into electric current, it can also transform electric current into light. The cathode ray tube is an application of this property. Through the aid of this tube, an electron beam is able to recreate an original image on the screen of a television receiving set. The electronic X-ray tube indirectly also transforms electric current into light, and by its effect on photographic plate, into light images. 
Here's how an X-ray tube works. A high potential ranging up to 300,000 volts or more is applied between the anode and cathode. Electrons are emitted by a focusing cathode. Due to the extremely high voltage, the electrons hit the anode with tremendous impact and cause the emission of waves of exceptionally high frequency. These high frequency waves do three useful things. Penetrate, excite fluorescence, or affect photographic plates. As a result, doctors can now study human internal organs by means of the fluoroscope. Or by means of radiography, they can photograph them. Industrial X-ray today is also playing a vital role, detecting porosities and fissures in welded metal seams examining heavy castings for invisible internal weaknesses. But X-ray isn't the only example of electronic usefulness in the conversion of current into light. The whole field of modern fluorescent lighting represents another application. So does the field of ultraviolet radiation. Harmless looking tubes like this one have a deadly effect on bacteria and other forms of microscopic life. In this demonstration, parmesia rather than bacteria are about to be subjected to sterile lamp rays. Notice what happens. The sterile lamp today is becoming increasingly important, both as a servant of public health and as a device for the preservation of perishable goods. So many and so varied are the applications of electronics that a single film like this can mention only one in a thousand. We haven't even mentioned, for instance, radar the electronic development that helped save Britain during the decisive weeks of the German aerial blitz. Here's what happened. Ultra-high frequency waves were broadcast into the skies from English defense stations. When enemy planes approached in the darkness or in the fog, these waves would reflect back to the transmitting points, thus giving warning to the defenders of Britain, permitting anti-aircraft batteries to swing into action and RAF planes to rise for combat. Whenever Hitler's bombers attacked, at whatever altitude, from whatever direction, British interceptors were waiting for them. As a result, the Luftwaffe was blasted from the English skies and the tide of war turned. The electronic tube, in essence, is only a switch. But what a switch! It rectifies, amplifies, generates, controls, transforms light into electricity and back into light again. These tubes that look so mysterious are essentially simple in operation, incredibly rugged and sure in application. They open and close all forms of electronic circuits as swiftly as the lightning flash and as silently as the passage of time. In the world of today, they're helping us to win a war. In the world of tomorrow, they bid fair to lift all of us to new levels of achievement, comfort, and security. The core material used in vacuum tubes, diodes, triodes, tetrodes, pentodes, and henceforth is tungsten filament. In transmitting tubes, carbonized tungsten filaments containing a small trace, 1 to 2 percent of thorium is employed. In receiving tubes, filaments coated with a mixture of barium oxide and strontium oxide, sometimes with addition of calcium oxide or aluminium oxide is employed. Now we shall see some specific vacuum tubes popular in the 21st century. However, most of the vacuum tubes have been replaced by transistors or integrated circuits, but few are still in use. 
The first one in this list is clistron or traveling wave tube. The different components of the clistron has been shown here and the components are listed on the right hand side of the slide. The traveling wave tube is an elongated vacuum tube with an electron gun, a heated cathode that emits electron at one end. A voltage applied across the cathode and anode accelerates the electrons towards the far end of the tube. And an external magnetic field around the tube focuses the electrons into a beam. At the other end of the tube, the electrons strike the collector which returns them to the circuit. Wrapped around the inside of the tube, just outside the beam path is a helix of wire, typically oxygen-free copper. The radio frequency signals to be amplified is fed into the helix at a point near the emitter end of the tube. The signal is normally fed into the helix via a wave kite or electromagnetic coil placed at one end, forming a one-way signal path, a directional coupler. By controlling the accelerating voltage, the speed of the electrons flowing down the tube is said to be similar to the speed of the radio frequency signal running down the helix. The signal in the wire causes a magnetic field to be induced in the center of the helix where the electrons are flowing. Depending on the phase of the signal, the electrons will either be sped up or slowed down as they pass the windings. This causes the electron beam to bunch up, known technically as velocity modulations. The resulting pattern of electron density in the beam is an analog of the original radio frequency signal. Because the beam is passing the helix as it travels and the signal varies, it causes induction in the helix, amplifying the original signal. By the time it reaches the other end of the tube, this process has had time to deposit considerable energy back into the helix. A second directional coupler positioned near the collector receives an amplified version of the input signal from the far end of the radio frequency circuit. Attenuators placed along the radio frequency circuit prevent the reflected wave from traveling back to the cathode. Higher powered helix traveling wave tubes usually contain beryllium oxide ceramic as both a helix support rod and in some cases as an electron collector for the traveling wave tube because of its special electrical, mechanical and thermal properties. Here is shown some varieties of clistron vacuum tubes. The first one is 400 kilowatt clistron used for a spacecraft communication. This is a high power microwave oscillator tube. The second one in the right hand side is the large clistrons used in the storage ring of the Australian synchrotron to maintain the energy of the electron beam. The third one at the bottom is a 5 kilowatt clistron tube used as power amplifier in the ultra high frequency television transmitter used during 1952. Next in the list is the magnetron. The cavity magnetron is a high power vacuum tube that generates microwaves using the interaction of a stream of electrons with a magnetic field while moving past a series of open metal cavities or cavity resonators. Electrons pass by the openings of these cavities and cause microwaves to oscillate within, similar to the way a whistle produces a tone when excited by an air stream blown past its opening. The frequency of the microwaves produced the resonant frequency is determined by the cavities 
physical dimensions. Unlike other vacuum tubes such as klystron or a traveling wave tube, the magnetron cannot function as an amplifier in order to increase the intensity of an applied microwave signal. The magnetron serves solely as an oscillator, generating a microwave signal from the direct current electricity supplied to the vacuum tube. A magnetron with sections removed to exhibit the cavities is shown here. The cathode in the center is not visible. The antenna emitting microwaves is at the left. The magnet producing a field parallel to the long axis of the device is not shown here. In the second picture, a magnetron is shown in section transverse to its axis. This is a magnetron from a microwave oven. The magnetron has a diameter of about 4 cm. There is a central cathode which is grey in colour. Everything else is copper and forms the anode. Around the anode, a total of 10 spokes are connected to the exterior of the magnetron. There are 5 plain spokes that are alternated with 5 notched spokes. The notches can be seen near the outer ring. Each pair of adjacent spokes, that is a plain spoke and the notch spoke, forms a resonant cavity. Around the cathode, two concentric ring, an inner ring and an outer ring can be seen. The inner ring electrically connects the notch spokes. The outer ring electrically connects the plain spokes. The inner and outer rings are known as strapping rings and ensures that the magnetron operates in the pi mode. For the notch spoke, that is roughly at the 10 o'clock position, the notch has an output coupling loop that extends towards and out of the top of the photo. The output coupling loop is used to couple microwave energy out of the magnetron so that the microwave energy can heat up food in the microwave oven. Incidentally, Note that the magnetron shown in this photo is almost exactly the same as the magnetron shown in other photo of the magnetron page. Next in the list is backward wave oscillator BWO. It is also called carcinotron or backward wave tube. It is a vacuum tube that is used to generate microwaves up to the terahertz range. Belonging to the traveling wave tube family, it is an oscillator with a wide electronic tuning range. The electron gun generates an electron beam that interacts with a slow wave structure. Thus, it sustains the oscillations by propagating a traveling wave backward against the beam. The generated electromagnetic wave power has its group velocity directed oppositely to the direction of the motion of the electrons. The output power is coupled out near the electron gun. It has two main subtypes, the M type, the most powerful one, and the O type. The output power of the O type is typically in the range of 1 milliwatt at 1000 gigahertz to 50 milliwatt at 200 gigahertz. Carcinotrons are used as powerful and stable microwave source. Due to the good quality wave front they produce, they find use as illuminators in terahertz imaging. Here in the picture on the left hand side of the slide is shown a miniature O-type backward wave oscillator tube produced by Varian in 1956. It could be a voltage tuned over an 8.2 to 12.4 GHz range and require a supply voltage of 600 volt. The backward wave oscillator Invented in 1951 by Rudolf 
from Fermat. Is a specialized linear beam tube which it generates microwaves. The accompanying ad copy says this tube can operate over 8.2 to 12.4 gigahertz range with supply voltage of 300 to 600 voltage. The body is approximately 4 inches long. The magnet required for operation weighs less than 5 pounds. Alternating to the image, the crop out ad copy is shown here. The picture down below is the backward wave oscillator at Stockholm University operating in the terahertz range. High power backward wave oscillator operating in the terahertz range together with a Teflon lens and kept in Stockholm University at the Department of Physics. On the right hand side is shown the concept diagram and the signals which travel from the input to the output as described in the explanation. A semiconductor is a material that in its pure native form is a good insulator that is a poor conductor but which can be made into a conductor via the controlled addition of a very small percentage of foreign elements through a process called doping. Typical semiconductors are widely used today are silicon, gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, aluminum nitride, germanium, alloy of silicon and germanium, indium, gallium or aluminium. Most of these are used in solar cells. Here is a very common picture showing the difference between the insulator, semiconductor and conductor materials. In a conductor materials, there is no band gap between the valence band and the conduction band. The two bands are merged together. This makes the electrons to flow conveniently through the conductor material. In an insulator, the band gap is quite wide between the valence and the conduction band. So the flow of electrons is not possible. However, in the semiconductor material, the band gap between the valence and the conduction band is narrow and it is possible to project the electrons from the valence band to the conduction band and made to flow through the material. We have already seen the diodes made from vacuum tubes. Now we shall see the diodes made from semiconductor materials. A diode is the simplest possible semiconductor device made by placing an n-type and a p-type semiconductor in direct physical contact. The region where they meet is called the p-n junction. The most common function of a diode is to allow an electric current to pass in one direction called the diode's forward direction while blocking current in the opposite direction that is the reverse direction. Thus the diode can be viewed as an electronic version of a check wall. This unidirectional behavior is called rectification and is used to convert alternating current to the direct current including extraction of modulation from radio signals in radio receivers. These diodes are forms of rectifiers. Due to their non-linear current voltage characteristics, there is possible to make numerous combinations for specified purposes. Now consider in more detail what happens in a diode when, say, an electron from the n-type region moving towards and enters the p-n junction region and wanders into the p-type material. In the p-type material, there are many missing electrons and thus the newly introduced electron has the possibility to fill one of these missing slots and in the process it loses energy. Pictorially, the electron finds a hole and eats it up, releasing energy or in more fancy language, the electron and the hole annihilate each other. The converse process works as well. 
a hole that moves to the right and enters the n type region represents a missing electron so one of the many extra electrons in the n type material can fill up that hole this process of electrons eating up the holes is called carrier recombination the two types of mobile charges recombine to the native state of the material an excess electron and the missing electron combine to make nothing extraordinary giving up the energy in the process as you can see the detail might be different but basically the diode creates a physical situation where once a current is made to flow electrons end up in a situation where they can enter low energy states and release energy one has turned the electrical driving energy from a battery for example into energy liberated by the electrons dropping into lower energy states all one has to do is now harness that liberated energy unless one has designed things properly this liberated energy is generally lost into heat however with the right choice of materials this liberated energy can be turned into light which underlines the light emitting diodes the different kinds of light emitting diodes have been shown here the material combinations which can help produce different kinds of light is listed below another concept is carrier photo generation the opposite process to recombination in an led is also possible light can be captured by a diode and turned into electron plus hole pair this is charge carrier creation the opposite process of recombination in fact all diodes are sensitive to light in this manner and the created electron plus hole then lead to a current in most circuits this is undesired behavior so the diode is clad in a light absorbing casing however this is obviously very useful for two applications first where one wants to detect light which means one has a photo diode and second where one wants to harvest the current as electrical energy so one is using the diode as part of a solar cell photovoltaic device as you can imagine one must choose materials and processing carefully to optimize the diode for each particular application the main photodiodes are shown here and the materials used for making photodiodes have been listed here this brings us to conclude the first part of the critical materials lecture now we shall see the another part of the lecture